Right. Um, my next guest on the podcast is Richard Bayer. Um, so Richard is the engineering manager and CI manager of Cobus UK in Hartlepool. He's worked in manufacturing for 30 years, or just shy of, with the bulk of that time being spent in automotive, mainly with NSK Europe. Um, Richard and I have, have actually never met nor spoken on the phone, which is the first time that's happened. So I'm really looking forward to this. He's been highly recommended to me. He's had a, a really interesting career in various positions. So looking forward to getting into this, Richard. So uh, well, look, firstly, nice to meet you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, welcome thank to you. you. Yeah, yeah, nice to see you too, yeah. Yes, how are, how are you? All good? I'm doing very well, yeah. It's uh, relatively bright weather outside um, and we're fit and healthy. So uh, Absolutely. I'm doing well, thanks. Absolutely. Well, look, I'd like to kick the podcast off the first question um, every time. So for you, what does it mean to be a leader? Okay, well, I mean, whenever I think of the word leader, you know, a couple of things come up. But what the first thing I'm reminded of is a conversation I had with a friend a long time ago who was very successful. And he was kind of introduced me that the difference between leadership and management. And I think uh, management is organizing things. It's the mechanisms. It's the practical side of controlling things. Whereas leadership, I think, is that human element. Because if there were no humans in your, in your team or in your environment, you wouldn't need leadership at all. You would just simply manage the, manage the resources that you have and deliver whatever you wanted to deliver. But as soon as humans are involved, fundamentally it changes. And I think the difference um, needs leadership. And leadership is about providing direction. It's uh, understanding your team. It's creating a culture. It's something quite different to management. And I used to not really know the difference. You know, someone would be called a leader or they'd be called a manager, my leader, my manager. But they are, to me, they're fundamentally different. And it's possible for someone with very good leadership skills to not be very good at managing and people with very good management skills not be very good at being leaders. So I think for sure the most effective people have both of those, both of those skills. I love that. And I think you're absolutely right because you can be a manager by job title, but to, to lead is, is something very different, isn't it? Very different. Yes. So, yeah, think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you don't need to be a, a boss of anyone to be a leader yeah. or to have leadership qualities. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, leadership is, is, a, is a wonderful thing. You know, that if, if people are able to provide good leadership or, you know, I, I try to be a good leader and when it works well, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. Brilliant. That's, a, that's an excellent answer. Great way to kick off. Um, so what I want to do is sort of take it back to, to day one, because I say I think it's, um, what, 29, 30 years this year, is it? You've been in, Yeah, I've like, stopped counting now, so uh, you can <laughs> yeah. say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just take it right back um, in terms of, I guess, for you in terms of your your, your first day. So was it, it was NSK Barons, wasn't it? So that was your first job out of yeah. university. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, you know, it might be worth just touching on why why I did a degree in the first place. You know, yes. I just always had a fascination growing up of fixing things and understanding how things worked. Yeah. Um, starting off with, you know, skeletrics that would break down or something, and I would get it working and, and get kind of a feeling of achievement from doing that. Um, then it just seemed natural to me to, to go into university, to get a degree, to become an engineer. My, my father was an engineer as well, so that's probably part of it. And um, so, yeah, so did an engineering degree and then didn't really know necessarily what I wanted to do with the engineering degree. Just I knew that I enjoyed learning about things and fixing things, making things work, improving things. Uh, so at that stage, coming out of university, I kind of thought, well, could go into research or could go into manufacturing. Uh, the, the pace of manufacturing uh, excited me. Uh, so, yeah, I, I joined NSK uh, and what a great place to join and to learn. It's Japanese based, continuous improvement mentality, uh, a local workforce. Um, you know, so you've got that northeast tradition of, uh, of engineering, which is very deep and, 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 you know, excellent. The northeast character, as you can tell, I'm not from the northeast, but uh, I love I love uh, I love, you know, the, the culture of the northeast and the, and the. The directness and, and kind of genuineness of people from the northeast you know that they, they say it how it is and, uh, and and i love that um so yeah that was day one was uh very green 
had the qualification, but very little actual skills uh, and was, was, you know, kind of got, got to wear the T-shirt, let's say, with lots of experienced people around me. And uh, yeah, that was a great start. And I think what's interesting, actually, that a lot of people I talk to have, have come through, I guess, apprenticeship or the, 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 on the job learning route and then got into it. You obviously went to the university route, which is which I find really interesting. And was that ever a, a conversation or a thought in your mind? Okay, I'm going to go the, the academic route, or I'm just going to get a job and learn. Was that was that a conscious decision, or is the way it happened? Um, when I went to university, my hometown was in Alston, which was very very small place. There was not really a, a good career opportunity uh, there. So I realized that the best way to get myself out there would be to, be, to become qualified yeah. uh, and therefore feel like I could open myself up to more job opportunities. Yeah. Um, I also believed that I would become more senior faster if I, if I got a degree. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true these days, uh, but that was, that was my belief at the time. But there really wasn't an option for me to do kind of the apprenticeship style. Yeah. Um, so that's why I did the academic route. Um, but now I think, you know, having worked with so many people who have gone through the academic route or through the, you know, the traditional apprenticeship style route, you know, I really don't think there's a one solution fits all mm -hmm. organizations benefit from mix of people. And the best teams I've had have had, have been a mix of people yeah. from the academic route and from the apprenticeship route. Um, and some more, more, more recently, some people are doing both. Mm -hmm. They're uh, they're actually starting an apprenticeship with a degree, or they're they're doing A levels and then doing an apprenticeship, which again I think is a superb uh, mix yeah. Uh, of, of of yeah find, finding out getting the best out of people because equally, you know, it may well have been that I may not have suited an apprenticeship route, and an apprentice who's done very well in their career may not suit an academic route. So uh, so. I think I think both are very valuable. Um, I did learn a lot of practical skills at NSK, uh, which was which was really important. If I hadn't gained those skills, I would have been limited in the, in the career I've had. So uh, so I guess I kind of ticked both boxes. Did the academic one first, yeah, and then went into an organisation that really promoted practical skills learning. You know, actually. Um, you know, taking them, taking the machines apart and fixing them and, and doing the maintenance on them and, uh, and really understanding the machines in, in detail. You mentioned something there, which I thought quite interesting, that you, you went to university, uh, again, because of perhaps not the same opportunity, but the main thing you mentioned was that it was the quickest route into a senior role. What, where was your motive? Where was your sort of drive behind that wanting to be your, your ultimate step? Um, so my... Uh, my childhood, we didn't, uh, me, me dad actually retired early, took voluntary redundancy from, from being an engineer. So we kind of did a little little version of the good life and, and left suburbia and the rat race and, and went and lived in the country, uh, which was great in many ways. But for a, for a young teenager, it was boring. <laughs> it was just too, <laughs> not enough going on. So I kind of resolved to myself that I wanted more out of life than that. So I wanted to get a decent job. Uh, be financially, you know, independent. And so that was my driver. I wanted, uh, like a lot of young people, believing that money would be the solution to, to your desires. Um, so that was my my innocent, naive uh, motivation to start with. Yeah. Great. So it was more of a, a financial side. I mean, when, when did the... It was, it was almost, for you, becoming a manager was, was going to be a byproduct of, of earning more and being more financially secure, or was there was a law of management and seniority? I think, I think, go, I think go hand in hand. I, yeah. think, I think go hand in hand. So I did have a desire to um, be in engineering mm -hmm. and become a manager of some sort. Uh, that was a, a desire I've had for a long time. Don't, don't necessarily know why, but that, that was... Uh, Sometimes I look at young people who don't know what to do and I, I feel a bit sorry for them. I was fortunate. I just, I just kind of had this desire to do that, right. um, which I guess is, is fortunate to have that, you know, that kind of head and heart aligned saying, that's what I want to do. Um, where, where, where did that come so, from? Uh, um, I think a desire to get out of, uh, out of the quiet countryside. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've, I've always had a fairly competitive nature. 
Yeah. Uh, just when playing games or sport. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I guess desire to own things and have things, I guess. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. And 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 obviously, look, NSK, you were there for for a long time. You watched, what, nearly 20, 24, 25 years in total? In total, nearly, yeah, probably a little bit more. But uh, yeah, I did a couple of stints at NSK. So that first period of NSK was as a, a production engineer yeah. uh, on the machining machining lines, um, running 24-7. Uh, and that's really where I was mainly on the tools, uh, learning the job, continuous improvement, breakdowns, maintenance systems, typical kind of... Uh, uh, you know, production engineering. Then uh, I decided to leave NSK. I got, uh, I went to uh, Ford. Well, it was actually uh, um, owned by uh, Jaguar. They took over the Halewood site at yep. uh, Liverpool, but it was uh, owned by Ford, like Jaguar was owned by Ford. Uh, but that was fascinating, uh, going to Halewood at a time of change, where it was changing from a... Uh, it would have been the old uh, Fiesta, um, not Fiesta, what was the previous one? Focus, yep. going from Focus production to uh, the new Jaguar X-Type production. So that was a, a real eye-opener to see really what was in many ways a lot of uh, leftovers from 70s and 80s British engineering mm -hmm. into modern, lean Jaguar product. That was a huge culture change and a really interesting time. Uh, met people from all over the world because Ford flooded that factory with, uh, with a lot of their best people all over the world to, to try and turn it and make that culture change. And that was, I think that's the biggest um, lesson I've, I've had in terms of culture and just how difficult culture is to change. Yeah. It's it's like one of these kind of huge um, container ships where it's got its momentum, it's going in a certain direction. You can put all the energy from the engines and the, um, the rudder to make this thing change, but it takes a long time to change. Uh, and I found that w that was really very, very evident at, uh, at Halewood. Yeah, um, for family reasons, I, I didn't stay in Liverpool. Um, we wanted to come back to the northeast. We'd just uh, we'd just got married and had a new baby, and there was other things happening in the family. Um, so we decided we wanted to come back to the northeast. Um, and at that stage, NSK um, found out I was coming back, and they asked me to rejoin, which uh, which I was not so sure I wanted to go back to somewhere I'd been to before. Um, but it was a totally different role. It was a new role, a uh, very exciting role, which was to establish a new customer, uh, sorry, a new supplier base in Europe. NSK was changing from quite uh, industrial bearings into automotive bearings, which were far higher value, far more complexity. And we needed a totally new customer base, uh, thank you, pardon, uh, supplier base to deliver us the components we needed to make these new bearings. Um, and they wanted me to be the technical element of that team that was going to set up the supply base. So that meant traveling all over Europe, um, around the world as well. And uh, I was in that department for 12 years, uh, started off as engineer and then became manager of that department. And in the end, we had uh, we had a budget of well over £100 million pounds a year. Um, we were supplying parts into Peter Lee uh, and delivering year-on-year -year cost down, uh, typically 3 or 4% cost down. So, you know, it was many multi-million pound cost savings each year. Um, and again, you know, what an amazing time it was to learn again about different styles, about different cultures, uh, styles of management across, you know, different countries, different industry types. Uh, and it was just a, a marvelous uh, environment to, to see different techniques, see how they work, uh, to be able to communicate with people who often English wasn't their first language. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I reckon I did uh, well over a million air miles, 25 different countries. Um, just, yeah, just a huge, huge life experience. And yeah. I think, you know, travel does really widen the, widen the, the brain and the mind. So uh, that was a really, uh, really interesting part of my career. It's, 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 that's an amazing experience. I, I think like, like you say, I think, 
the disadvantage some, sometimes people can have staying at a company for so long is that they, they aren't open to different cultures and, and different environments. But a setup like that and yeah. able to travel to different sites and, and see how they run, it's you, you, essentially it's best of both worlds. So I get you, you have your security yeah. and your, your home where you are, but you, you get to bring... Because I, I, I yeah. imagine even that, that year at Jaguar, I bet you came back to an SK a, a completely different person, I imagine, after seeing that. Oh, yeah, def- definitely. Because, uh, you know, seeing seeing change... Seeing contrast mm. is so important to appreciate and, and evaluate what you currently have, either good or bad. Yeah. But it's that it's that change of scene which creates new thoughts, new growth. I mean, if you think of evolution of anything, it requires change. Yeah. Things will only improve with change. Yep. And by putting things in new environments, you then you then create new 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 countermeasures new activity new solutions new thoughts and i think that's why travel is just so so fantastic and not only the experiences of you know being in uh, in india or china um or you know in uh, sweden or where poland wherever it was but once you've had that experience you then get quite a nice period of time on the plane where you can absorb it all yeah, yeah, and think. Yeah, before a lot of people don't have thinking time in the modern world, yeah. whereas plane travel actually provides quite good thinking time, and uh, it's something I I grew to miss when my career changed. After all the travel, um, I realised that that thinking time. Uh, sometimes you think it's boring sitting on a plane, and, and often I did, but actually, in terms of keeping the mind organised and uh, and and kind of reflecting, considering, strategising. Those were important times of uh, of that job. Yeah, okay. I, I resonate with that. I guess it's a bit like if you have a you know a fantastic training um, presentation or anything, you come out super motivated and, and and lessons to learn, but actually straight back into the same old routine. You haven't got the time to to actually assess it and make yeah. change. Yeah. I mean, have you yeah. tried to to replicate the advantage in, into into roles where you've had to force yourself to and you and the team to have time to sort of reflect? Would you say no? Yeah, de- definitely. It's incredibly difficult. But yes, definitely thinking time is so important, but it's so difficult. Uh, it's so difficult to to create. I think one thing I've certainly uh, recognized in, in work, not just for myself, but for my teams and, and the, my department's performance is the difference between urgent and important. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is a massively important theme throughout every day of everyone's working life because obviously the urgent things take your priority take your take your uh, interest and take your take your attention but of course if we only ever do the urgent things we're only ever firefighters and we don't make improvement yeah but if we just want to make uh, loads of improvement and don't look at the uh, short term then we can these fires can get out of control so that balance is hugely important and Honestly, wherever I've had the resources available, I've really tried as much as possible to try to create dedicated resource for, for important. Yeah. Okay. So try to split. So you almost, if you've got a team of five, you might say, well, one guy, he's got no objectives at all. All his job is to protect that team of four from the noise of today. Could be anything. Yeah. Could be a minor thing that's fell over that just needs addressing. So and so has got a query, and and they would literally be the. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just reminded me of that post you put about about Kaylee, you know, that uh, uh, the Kante, the uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Angolo yeah. Kante, you know, that that person who just does yeah. everything, you know, that just kind of keeps the noise, keeps yeah. the noise away, uh-huh. uh, and in such a, a clever and silent way. So um, so yeah, if if you can do that, then you can say right now I can be strategic. I can be organized. I can give out jobs. This person, rather than this person coming in at, at the start of the day, saying, right, what urgent things have I got? Who wants something from me on email? Yeah, and most people crank up the email and go, what do people want from me? Yeah. Um, whereas if you've got someone else who says, no, no, I'll take care of all of that. Mm-hmm. When you go home on a night, you know what you're going to be picking up the next morning. It's going to be a continuation of this project or this improvement theme. And that means that then we, we've actually got control over improvement rather than it being a, um, an add-on. If we get round to it, 
<laughs> which of course no one ever gets round to these things yeah. because the urgent takes over all the time. So, uh, so yeah, so having really strict kind of regimes in place to manage the difference between urgent and important, I think is is really, really, really important. And I can't say I'm not perfect at this. I struggle every day without myself. <laughs> Love that, brilliant. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, of when you when you started, when was the when was the first sort of supervise your management where right, the Yobby manager team now, Richard, that this is this is you. When when did that first start? It was actually in that first period of uh, that first six years of being a production uh, engineer. I had a service group member uh, that I recruited. Um, excellent guy, and he's gone on to be uh, an engineering manager himself. So uh, really, really pleased with the progress he's made, and uh, he was, you know, became a friend as well. Um, so that was the first time. And I think my style has always been to um, try to give people as much freedom to solve things in their own way. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably because that's what how I like to be, how I like to work. I don't like to be micromanaged. I like to be kind of told, well, that's the solution we need. That's the result we need. Yeah. You know, go and do it. Um, rather than being taken through how it's supposed to be done and then kind of overly, overly kind of monitored and kind of will try this and try that. So that's always been my style to be fairly hands off. Um, but it's interesting when I then, the next job I had at Jaguar was actually as a production supervisor. So it was quite a big change to go from engineering to supervision. Um, and I realized that that approach was less effective. Yeah. So with people uh, in production, I don't like to categorize, you know, and generalize and, and, and overly label, but in general, I found that people in production more so prefer to be told what to do. So put that there, put that there, press that button and set it away. And, you know, and that, and that, that kind of is a better way than, oh, well, I'll leave you to work it out. Yeah. You know, we need to make this many parts today. I'll leave you to work it out. That is that that approach doesn't work with a lot of people I've met who tend to tend to work on the front line in production. They want to be much more directed. Just tell us how to do it. Stop, you know, stop messing about. Just tell us how, tell us what you want, and I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Stop with it. Stop with the uh, smoke mirrors or the you know. Just just tell us what you want. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so, right, uh, so that was, that was getting a balance back with your team, isn't it? And and, and understanding. Who needs what? That's a real difficult scenario because it's day one. It's difficult. It's tricky to know who who is motivated by and how, isn't it? Difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, absolutely. And uh, one of the one of the the thoughts I've, I'd had, like if I, if I was to go back to my first day of supervising someone, yeah, um, I would I would probably say to myself, learn about the person. I would say empathize and learn about that person and the reason i say that um and i was guilty of it definitely and sometimes i still still am guilty of it i've had lots of technical people good technical people who at some stage need to lead people as you become better and better technically at some point someone says oh can you be the leader of that team um and then that is a big transition for often for technically based people to to, to, to become in that human regime and, you know, the, the countless times I've had the scenario where the leader will be saying to me, yeah, but they won't listen to me. They just don't do it how, how I like, how it should be done. Um, and I say, yeah, but have you tried this? Have you tried that? Well, I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to try that. They should just listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and the example I give to them, I says, OK, think about, uh, think about when you're repairing your washing machine at home. And you're fiddling around at the back and you find this little screw that needs to come out. And you take out this tool out of your toolbox and you try and undo the screw and the screw doesn't undo. And then you realize it's not a screw. It's actually a hex, a hex drive. So you go and get the hex drive and then you undo it. And I say to them, you're happy doing that, aren't you? You're happy identifying the right tool yeah. for the screw. But what you're doing in this case is you're saying, they should all respond to my screwdriver. Yeah. <laughs> regardless, yeah. regardless of, you know, and, and if they don't regard with it, if they don't work with the screwdriver, I'm just going to turn it harder. Yeah. Well, what do you do? You break the screw. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you got, you got, a, you got a breakdown. You got, you got a failure. So I'm trying to get them to realize that humans are different. They're all unique, just like screws are different. And you don't, you don't expect the screw to perform mm -hmm. if you use the wrong tool. 
Yeah. So just in dealing with people, you've got to learn what's the right tool for the right person. How do you? And, uh, that's had quite a good effect on a lot of a lot of the technical people to, yeah. to actually because they, they can then relate that to uh -huh. well, it'd be stupid using the wrong tool. You know, you're an idiot if you try and use the wrong tool on a job. Yeah. Um, and then they think, ah, right. So I've got to use the right tool with people. And it's the same. Yeah, and, and and after a while, your toolbox becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and you've got more more options at your disposal. Yes, you yes, it. yes. And of course, the, the mistake a lot of people make is not only do they not realise they need a wide toolbox, just like you've mentioned, but they're not even taking the time to realise what tools this person might need to yeah. be, you know, engaged with. How so, do you, uh, so yeah, I think um, understanding how, understanding your people. What do you have any tips in terms of? How you understand? I mean, let, let's, I guess, say a scenario where someone's starting the role and, you know, a new position, new team. How, what was the first step to understanding how people do work and, and why? I think watching and listening. I think, uh, I think that's the first thing. Give those people the, uh, give those people the floor. When I came to Caveris, I knew nothing about making, making bags. Absolutely nothing. Um, not from this industry um didn't understand the machines certainly didn't know the people yeah knew not knew nobody here at all um so you know the concept of me trying to come in and saying well this is how we should do it you know me coming in saying well i'm automotive this is how we should do it i'm thinking well that's to me that's just prone to failure it's it's disrespectful to the people here uh this this business has been around 50 years so you know you've got to have a lot of respect to say that this is a successful business so it was very much about me understanding the business and that means understanding the people. And so it would be, yeah, a lot of listening, a lot of questioning, and then, you know, clearly listening to the answers, but not just taking it as gospel, challenging them. Why? So why is that then? Why do you think that? And really kind of getting that understanding uh, of the machines, the processes, but the people, the relationships between the people, there's not a high turnover here, so there'll be a lot of uh, interdepartment relationships, personal relationships. So understanding all of those is important. And then by having that relationship and that engagement, then I've got half a chance of having traction and then maybe starting to influence things and saying, well, can we do this? Can we do that? And since since starting at Caveris, uh, you know, there's been a lot of improvements. And I'm not saying that because I've come here, but there's been a lot of, lot of improvements. The shop floor layout has been dramatically improved. Our CEO delighted with the results. Um, we're having you know, much more, um, many more meetings now, but they're sharp meetings, they're quick meetings. Uh, some are based on the shop floor, some uh, some are, are in meeting rooms, but they're, they're they're quick meetings with bullet points. But then when we leave the meeting, we know who's doing what. Great, and I think that's uh, that's massively important. Um, I see so many morning meetings over the years where people meet. They talk about the problems and they all go, yeah, that, that's really terrible. That needs looking at. That needs looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's looking at it? Yeah, exactly. Who knows? They're going to come back to us. Yeah. What's the result that's required? Yeah. You know, so what happens is come in the next day and you go, oh, what's happened with so-and-so? And everyone going looking around that person who was going to go and go and pick it up. Yeah. So, you know, meetings have to be functional. They have to have an outcome. And normally those outcomes are actions which are addressed to individual people and preferably with a time base against them as well. You can't be. Um, but, you know, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to kind of uh, overly pressurise this organisation. It's not automotive. Um, it's a good company and it's performing well. And we can, we can just improve in our own kind of um, organic way. We don't have to suddenly expect to become automotive. It's not necessarily appropriate. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, people who work in automotive find it quite toxic now. You know, it's it's not it it might be the pinnacle in terms of performance, but it's not the pinnacle in terms of, of job satisfaction and, and being a being a, a good member of society. You know, a lot of people uh, find it find it very stressful. I certainly did. You know, that I I left it. I consciously left automotive because it was uh, it was taking over my life. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and so I mean. You're, it's evident you are a leader, and I can I can tell from talking to you how you would motivate people extremely well. What do you still find challenging about about management and managing people? Would you say? I think I think it's always the balance between the business needs and 
yeah, the people's needs. I think that's that's always the challenge. So the business always wants more for less, and uh, and that that's that will never ever change. That's that that is what business is, you know. We're, but it, but we're 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 to fault when we go to uh, a car showroom. We want the best car for the cheapest price. Yeah. <laughs> so you know we we are the consumers that we're actually fighting so hard and working so hard to supply <laughs> so it's quite a, but that's that's market forces so the business will always want more for less that that is taken as red and people generally don't want to work harder for less mm -hmm. yep so so people want more and if anything they want their job to get easier or, or yes. you know less stressful or become more capable so you've got these two totally diverging needs yep. and i think management is often right in the middle of that how can we how can we get these things to work yeah. and uh, and i think it's understanding i think it comes from recognizing that you know people have got to realize that, that, that there's no free lunches you've got to earn money uh, and the business has to earn money to pay you and therefore you can do what you want to do with life so you know i can be quite frank with people at times if you don't like working here don't come to work yeah but we won't pay you <laughs> yeah, <this is> good, <laughs> you know yeah. so Please don't think you do me a favor coming to work. I want you to come to work. Yeah. But if you don't want to come to work, don't come to work. That's fine. We'll 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 you know we'll move forward with, in another way. So it's not my job to make you happy at work. It's my job to make a positive environment, a productive environment. But if you're not going to bring the ingredient of having any desire to be here, it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. So you know people have to people have to want to want to come to work, and people can have off days, and some. Some of the grumpiest people are not actually that grumpy. It's just their happy place. It's just yeah. it's just their character. <laughs> they like to moan. They like to twist. Yeah. But that doesn't mean they're not good at the jobs or they're not going to go and do it. They might just want to tell you it's a load of rubbish before they, they set off and do, do a very good job. So, yeah. again, it's understanding which tool to use. If if I chose to take, take offense at how everyone's character was, then I would be a very poor leader because yeah. it's, you know, it, you've got to, you know, you're not you're not not to be a mug, and you got to act, you know there are limits. But you know, if someone if someone's kind of unhappy about something, and you're asking them to do a job which they really don't want to do, you say, well, yeah, if it's going to help you to have a little whinge, have a little whinge, but then get on and do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and right. sometimes my job is to be a bit of an anchor aunt, you know, and <laughs> uh, and let them let them offload. But at the end of the day, it's about the team delivering practical and actual results. It's, it's interesting because I, I put a poll out on, on LinkedIn. I was polls everywhere on LinkedIn for the week about why people stay and, and uh, why people move jobs. And, and culture was the most, was number one. And I, if I'd done that two years ago, I don't think culture would have even been a consideration. So I think people yeah. now, it's almost expected level, I guess, that, that there's, and like you say, that there was environment created by the employees, which is, which is a positive one, which look, I think it's a great shift. I think it's really good. But I also think it yeah. puts pressure on us to make sure that the environment we have is, is highly cultured. <laughs> Sorry about that, Mark. So I, th I think it's it's created a culture now, which is a pressure on, on us creating a culture, which is going to be healthy, which I think is a good thing, but it's still a difficult balance for an employer to manage yeah. a thing on a daily basis, isn't it? It's tricky. Yeah. It is, but you know, if you look at the the needs of people, and I've, I guess over the years I've kind of got very interested in psychology. You know, understanding how people's minds work, how my mind, how my mind works. You know, I've been on a, 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 a very kind of important journey for myself. But um, but if you look at people's needs, you know, maybe a uh, hundred years ago or in poorer countries, I think people's needs is basically to eat. Yeah. Obviously, yep. breathing is important, drinking, eating, you know, enough to eat and have shelter. And, and, and when people are faced with those scenarios, I think their their mind is taken up with achieving those very critical needs. Now, when you look at the UK, the vast majority of people do not have those concerns to that level. Unfortunately, some people do. But in the working world, the vast majority of people will have three meals a day. They do have shelter. You know, they do have access to healthcare. So I find that people then, their mind becomes occupied by chasing something else because their basic needs are met. Mm -hmm. Look at the power of Facebook and uh, Instagram. This is, uh, I think this is, a, this is a really interesting part of society, which is demonstrating how important people find it to be accepted, how important people find it to be 
to be part of the community. I think this is a, a basic human need to feel uh, feel a part of something. Yeah. I did hear um, this old Aborigine tribe, uh, forgive me for the details, but uh, they were the, the separate from society. And the most severe punishment they could give their people was total isolation. And this meant that they became invisible. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't talk to them. They wouldn't listen to them. They wouldn't look at them in the eye. And what tended to happen is those individuals, after a period of time, would just go off and go off into the wilderness and die. Yeah. Because they were, that was that it like was that painful for them. Mm-hmm. Lack of lack of any human contact and lack of um, almost being present. Yeah. No present. You didn't matter. You hadn't. There was nothing. There was almost like no point in living. So now, when we come back to to work and what motivates people, you can see now why culture is so important. Because basically the financial needs are met. I think people only want more money so they can get a better car than their friend or have a better house than they already have. Um, but I think people are finding that there's no limit to that. Yeah. You, that won't provide long-term happiness. It'll only be you know, fulfilling until you then stabilize at that level of, of wealth. And then you want, want a greater level of wealth. You just want it more. Um, never, never enough. I think, mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think ultimately people are looking for acceptance and are often it's acceptance in their own mind. And uh, so that's, I find that side of life really fascinating, understanding yeah. the psychology of, uh, of my own head and, and other papers. There's a book I'm reading right now um, from Johan Hari called Lost Connections. And, it, and it's, it's about mental health and depression. And, it, and essentially it's, it comes back to the fact that ultimately it's, we need meaningful connections and, and we are need to be adding value. And I think the connection thing is the big one. And that, that analogy yeah. is... Right. I yeah, I totally agree. So there was a study uh, that was conducted in America, started 70 years ago. Obviously, it's quite strange for these studies to last so long. That's over three generations. So the people organizing the study, you know, have to transfer it onto different people. It covered three different people's careers. So it's a huge study. And it was to see the difference between people growing up from, uh, let's say, a privileged environment, Harvard, uh, to more, you know, basic one, uh, which was the Bronx. And there was about 50, 50 lads, young lads uh, from each area. And they were studied through their entire lives, uh, right through to death in many times. Some, some are still alive uh, through their marriages, relationships, different careers, health issues. And every, every year or so, they'd go and interview them and ask them all sorts of parameters about their lives. Uh, and so they're able to kind of, you know, come up with the, the answer of what makes people happy or what makes people successful. And the overriding result was not money, not health, uh, not career. It was relationships. Relationships. So people who were uh, embedded in society, who had good relationships, authentic relationships, they dealt with illness better. They dealt with hardship better. Whether they they were rich or poor, they were able to deal with it. So... I think connectedness, as you say, I, I totally agree. I think it's, it's especially for our society, which fortunately most people have their basic needs met. I think it's connectedness, which is what people are actually looking for. And if people realize that, they might avoid spending 30 years trying to earn enough money so they could feel justified in the world. Yeah. Whereas actually, they don't need to do that. If they want to do that, great, that's fine. But do it with an open open mind and, and realize that actually you're already justified. Yeah. You're already justified in, in whatever you're doing, you know, as long as you're being, you know, <laughs> social, sociable and uh, not going around uh, making life horrible for people. You're already justified in what you're doing and it's self-acceptance, which I think is uh, is so important. I mean, there's there's been lots of times in my life I haven't accepted myself a lot. So, yeah. uh, so it's an important aspect. And I think for a, for a leader to to communicate that so well, but to, to, to have that as a mindset, I think it's really important because obviously ultimately you, 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 you understand why people do things and, and what makes people tick. But obviously, like you say, people can have off days and, and sometimes, you know, there's, there's stuff going on underneath. Um, I mean, if you, you put a post out a few months ago, which I thought was, was amazing. It, it was, it was brave. It was honest and it, and it would have helped thousands and thousands of people. And it was about mental health and, and, it was about your journey, your journey through that, which I thought, and I think 
there's a obviously I think not not as much now, but there's still a certain stigma around mental health, and, and particularly men, and particularly I think people in senior positions, because I I can resonate with the fact as a leader as a manager, I think there's almost a an expectation that we've got our you know everything's we've got our shit together, and, and we don't have bad days, and 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 it's almost yeah. almost. So I'm scared sometimes of having a bad day of coming in when when I'm potentially 100 percent because it's going to affect everyone else. But I think that isn't that that shouldn't be the case because we're we're human beings and we're people like everyone else. And I think actually to show that honesty, I imagine as daunting as it is to to, to do something put something out that I imagine you got a lot out of that and you will help people. But actually, people have seen you as a leader being honest about the battles. I mean, how, how was that? How was that received? And what were your thoughts when, when, when I guess you put that out there? Yeah, I mean, it was it was received very well. And thank you for your comments. Um, all positive for, for, to start with. You know, there was no there was, there was not one ounce of, of negativity that I was aware of, um, either directly or indirectly. You know, no one ended up treating me differently. Or I, was, I just joined Caveris. Uh, so I was a little bit thinking I don't want I don't want them to think I'm Tom Nutter because <laughs> uh, I you know hadn't had time, time to build relationships. But I, I thought no, it, it's I wanted to be genuine. Um, it was coming up to Christmas. I know that can be a difficult time for people. And the previous Christmas, as I said in the post, um, unfortunately I didn't want to be here, and uh, and that was that was very very tough to to come to terms with that. Uh, and in, in, in 12 months, I did come to terms with it with the help of my family, um, people, you know, organization, all sorts of things. And I'm so much wiser uh, having gone through that journey as painful and as, 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 as you know, as hard as it was. Um, and I really the post was meant to say, um, you're not alone. If you're feeling like that, you're not alone. Um, you know, and, and it was to reach out because the first step I made to recovery was reaching out and telling people and accepting that I wasn't healthy. And if I hadn't done that, I don't see how it would have been possible for me to get better if I hadn't reached out. So that post was really to say, um, please reach out if you're affected or you think someone else is affected, please reach out um, because there's lots of help out there. There's lots of acceptance out there. Um, I joined a a club in Hartlepool called Andy's Man Club. It's a national uh, club and I think over the next few years you, you, it's going to become more popular uh, people are going to become more aware of it. There's, there's over 100 clubs in the country now so uh, every Monday night all over the country you know sometimes up to 2,000 people are joining these clubs uh, and these are just ordinary guys coming to talk to reach out to make a connection and we talk about all sorts of things um, we're not allowed to talk about politics religion or medication but apart from that and talk about anything and it goes literally from someone telling an awful story about what's happened to them awful events right through to then someone cracking a joke and everyone having a good laugh you know it's uh it's it's a they really are amazing amazing nights and uh there's one in horden now as well um like i say if, if people are interested just put andy's man club in google um and you and it's free you don't need any referrals um you can just turn up and uh and, and see what it's like and, and you can you can sit there and just listen if you don't want to talk, or you can talk as much as you like. And it's uh, they're really, really, really are very good groups. And we've had people who have been to AA and, and not found them successful, and, and find a lot more success in uh, in the Andy's Man Club group. And it's, it's not a competition; it's just coming back to the tools, isn't it? Some tools work for some, and some tools work for others. Um, so, but yeah, I think um, I think mental health, I think as you say, is becoming less of a stigma, and the biggest the biggest thing that mental health feeds on is um, lack of connection. If people are left to their own devices, that's when uh, mental health can deteriorate. Uh, when you talk about things to the right people, then that's when uh, when you can start making the steps to recovery. Yeah, amazing. I think that's, that's brilliant. I mean, and, and I guess you know, COVID is an example of, of how different that was for different people. Um, yeah, I, I, I was on, it was only this morning actually. I was speaking to speaking to someone. And I said how I was probably at my most content in lockdown, and and it was quite bizarre because I was lucky that I was in a you know work was secure. Uh, there probably wasn't as much pressure as, as they are as daily sort of you know sort of the stuff and talk about convey about how much stuff there wasn't that convey about. But actually, I had more time with my family. 
I had much more, my connections with my kids were, were a lot better. I had to walk outside every day and it was quite a simple life. And the, 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 probably the polar opposite. And actually when we went for a process, when we were furloughing some of our staff, it wasn't a case of right, who, who my best bill is, who'd be best. It was a case of, you know what, who lives by himself, who, who lives in the family, you know, who's, who's going to, who knows how long we're going to be in this situation for, who do we have to sort of help in this situation? And that, that's how we did things. It was, okay, she lives by herself, you know, this is gonna, this is gonna be difficult. If she's working and she's on Zoom this four times a day and, and you know, that's gonna help and that, and that's what we did, but it's getting back to what you said, isn't it? I think it's the, it's the connections, the daily connections we have with people, meaningful connections that essentially yeah. are gonna dictate how we feel on a daily basis. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, these feelings, I, I kind of liken it to a, a diet, you know, a food diet. Anyone who's looked after themselves diet-wise, and I need to lose weight, but I, I know what it means to have a good diet. And uh, um, people who understand diet understand that it takes time to create that regime. It takes time for the body to become better, to become healthier. Um, and if they, if they lose that healthy food, It'll take time, but it will deteriorate again. And, it, and it's it's quite clear. Yeah. And I think it's exactly the same with mental health. Agree. You said you're taking your daily walk before, you're less stressed, da, 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 da. your mind slowly recovers mm -hmm. and it becomes healthy. Yeah. Then if you lose those things, two or three months down the line, you go, oh, what's wrong with it? I'm stressed a bit. Oh, yeah. Haven't been to the gym. Yeah. Haven't been eating right. Yeah. Haven't been sleeping right. I've been worrying about this. a bit, And you think, well, that's not a surprise <laughs> you know? so you know if you want to have good mental health you need probably as much or more care as you would eating yeah if you want to eat healthily and have a healthy body you can see the relationship yeah it's, there's not many people have a healthy body without eating healthy some some do but some lucky people do but generally speaking <laughs> yes. if you want a healthy body eat healthily if you want a healthy mind create a healthy environment in your life you and it. uh, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to say well, I haven't got time to do this. I haven't got time to do that. I, you know, I, my life was busy when I had a younger family, so I, I appreciate that. But then maybe it's, it's more healthy to say to yourself, yes, I'm stressed out. Yes, I'm tired. But that's okay because I've got a busy life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rather than saying, what's wrong with my life? I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. You know, say, well, you're busy. You, you, you've got a family. So, you know, change it or learn to live with it. But don't put pressure on yourself to say, yeah, I can't stop doing those, but I still want to be happy. I want this healthy body, but I want to eat McDonald's every day. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, nice, isn't it? <laughs> no, massively agree. Um, so, I mean, you, I mean, we talk about the analogy of the, of the, the toolbox and, and the amount of things, you know, you've obviously built that up over time to, to be where you are now over the 30 period. Who's been the biggest influence on your career? And would you say either outside, of, you know, outside of work, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good question. I find it hard to say one person, mm -hmm. uh, but I will say one person, and his name's Keith. I'm not a name dropper, so I'll just say his first name. If he ever watches this, he'll know who he is. Uh, and a few, he, he was my boss for a lot of time at, at NSK. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason is, apart from him being supportive, I think he gave me the energy to do the things I've done. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he believed in me, he supported me, he gave me good, good wisdom, um, created a great culture, which I tried to create the kind of cultures that he created. So I think he was a great leader. Um, and I learned a lot from him. Um, but I, I could also list, you know, many other people who even people I don't know, yeah. Alex Ferguson, uh, <laughs> Toto Wolf, you know, I find these people, great leaders, Winston Churchill, you know, the, the speeches that I don't know much about history, but listening to his speeches, I just think, my God, this person has been tasked with trying to motivate a country to go into war and defend itself. Yeah. You're thinking, wow, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And you listen to those speeches and how he delivers them and you just go, that's incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Um, so I think, I think I've got inspiration from dozens, dozens of, people and events rather than uh you know highlighting highlighting one in particular but i guess uh i guess i've got a soft spot for keith <laughs> and he introduced me to my wife which at times i'm not sure was a good thing <laughs> only joking <Julie. laughs> no i love that and, and i mean you mentioned obviously right right at the start this you mentioned obviously 
where you grew up and, and your dad and, and so on. So, I mean, if, it's family, obviously, family. But now, has family always been an inspiration to you? And, and you know, do you, do you, do you take inspiration early doors from, from your dad or anyone else, I guess? Or? Uh, not, not so much, because my dad kind of finished his career and, and he was more of the more kind of, if anything, he's inspired me to see beyond work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, his brother uh, is actually is his 90th birthday this weekend. Um, he's very successful. He's, uh, you put him in Google and you can learn all about him. Yeah. Um, so he's been very successful. So the two brothers have kind of taken different paths. Mm -hmm. So I can kind of get inspiration from the the guy who's got the big success and I can get inspiration from my dad who's yeah. found happiness without monetary value and without kind of possession. So, you know, I kind of, I, it's another example. You can get inspiration from everywhere, from yeah. from, from left-handed things and right-handed things, from good things, from bad things. You know, it's it's how you take what you can take from those. That's uh which, which, is, which is probably why you are like you are because obviously you are you are obviously extremely driven and, and very successful but like you say you still know what's important to you and ultimately that is is happiness and and a connection you come from yeah. it so you, you you probably have been inspired a lot i guess and molded by that so not that. definitely yeah definitely yeah and, yeah and also you know my family yeah. uh my children my wife you know the, the things they say to me and uh make me think about things and uh yeah it's uh yeah wonderful yeah, love that. Um, no, brilliant. Well, look, two um, two questions I'd like to sort of ask at the end. Um, firstly, what do you think are the, are the three things that make make up a good leader? What do you say? I think empathy, mm -hmm. uh, because empathy isn't always taking someone's side. Empathy is understanding. Empathy is engaging, seeing someone you know, being with them. So you, you can really have that connection. Um, direction, direction is critical. Um, I, I kind of have an example of this old, you know, Viking ship where everyone's rowing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and if I said to you, Mark, okay, you're the leader on that ship. Where are you standing? Yep. And some people, some people say, well, I'm, I'm rowing. I'm rowing like mad to make the boat, boat go as fast as I can. I say, okay, fair enough. And I'll say, well, which which direction is the boat going in then? Well, you can't see when you're rowing, can you? So, so I I think the right position for a leader is to be on the on the tiller at the back of the boat, watching the direction and watching how everyone's performing, yeah. and then understanding. Yet yeah, this person's got a problem. You know, do I need to go and help? Do I need to address it? But actually, just literally going going on the on the oars and rowing as hard to show everyone how hard they can row is quite limited. In, in what you can achieve sometimes you might do that but so so direction direction i think is uh is really important um and then i think the the next one is culture uh and that's behaviors how you know cultures are, are created by behaviors um you know I, I haven't been to theo james but i've watched your posts and i know a couple of people there and it feels very much i, I get a real identity of your culture and i think that comes from you mark Who's that? and i think you know so by your behaviours and 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 your your aura and, and who you are, so I think uh, the leaders are very much responsible for for culture. Yeah, love that. I can't completely get it all. And actually, what you said about direction was fascinating because it's something I still battle with. I think it's it's almost easier to lead from the front, isn't it? To to do as I do, and I still find that easier to to get on the phones yeah. to sell and, and to to people to almost be swept along with that but actually the real skill is is directing and and not needing to show and i think that's yeah probably what yes. you i'm still learning myself to to get there i think it's it's it's, it's harder yeah. to direct and lead i think it's in that in that respect yes yeah yeah oh de definitely definitely because the leader can just be ignorant to what's happening behind him yeah, yeah. and then complain if people aren't keeping up <laughs> <laughs> exactly that um and, and just finally i mean in terms of, of manufacturing i mean the reason these podcasts are, are exactly like today to people to learn from people like you and, and who've walked the path and be able to into management but also I'm passionate about manufacturing right and I, I love manufacturing and, and I think manufacturing has its challenges and I'm always keen to to speak to people in it to see how, how we think we can improve it I mean how do you think given the the challenges that many manufacturers face right now what do you think is the best way and, and to, to try and improve the future of manufacturing would you say well I think uh Obviously, the, the world over the last few years has become smaller. Companies want to become global. So 
Um, you can buy anything from anywhere these days. And as we can see, the economy is so linked uh, to itself globally. But I think that trend may change because of political differences. But also uh, you can see Brexit. Uh, the, the, the trading channels might not be as easy as, as we, we, we always thought they would be. Um, but also the, the environmental aspect of transporting things all over the world. So I'm, I'm interested, I, I kind of suspect, and this is just a hunch, that um, the world will go from a little bit less global and more local. Mm -hmm. So I think that manufacturers will be more attractive to customers if they're local, if they're nearby. Yeah. So I think that's one, one very interesting aspect, particularly for UK manufacturing. Um, but the other thing that UK manufacturing has to be abundantly aware of is we can't compete, even though it's a little bit contradictory to, to what I've just said, we can't compete with low cost countries on low value products. So, you know, clothing or something like that, you know, or uh, or probably steel making, you know, it's just, there's just not a, an opportunity really. It's fundamentally flawed. Yeah. Um, so we've got to pursue higher value, more difficult product, uh, which other people can't, can't deliver. To the to the right levels of uh, of, of quality and uh, and service, I still think the UK has got an exceptional reputation globally. Obviously, we do knock ourselves. We know we're not the best, but when you compare us to ninety percent of the countries, we we are in the top echelons of uh, of uh, credibility. Um, so we should utilize utilize that wherever possible. Um, but I think that the most important thing is getting into the youth. If school leavers are not interested in pursuing manufacturing, then we won't have the talent to, to, to deliver in the future the challenges that, that manufacturing are going to bring. Unfortunately, um, people think of manufacturing as boring factory work or dirty engineering work. Yep. And there's a lot, of, a lot of school leavers are not attracted by that. Oh, well, obviously, when it's, when it's expressed like that. What I see in manufacturing is a hugely diverse challenge, which is interesting, engaging. You get to travel the world. You get to meet all sorts of different people. You know, every day is different. And it's a, it's like this colorful jungle that you're going into. Now, some people find jungles oppressive and, and overly stressful and they want to get out. Other people find them engaging and fascinating and, and want, want to get involved. So I think manufacturing should do a lot more to uh, change that very negative and misleading perception in schools but it's going to be difficult to do because because no individual factory is going to be able to deliver that um i mean i'm trying to work, make close relationships with the with the college Caveras has been very supportive of that we're trying to make real connections with the college for mutual benefit and uh, and then also you know growing that interest from young people in the manufacturing and if we have the right people we can achieve anything Excellent. Love it, love it. And look, thank you so much for that. This has been, it's been brilliant. And look, the, the, another reason, and the byproduct of me doing this, this podcast is that I learned a lot, in all honesty. And uh, I felt that I've learned a heck of a lot today from a, from a real solid leader who understands people and, and what makes people tick and, and how, they, how to get the best out of them. And um, yeah, I think the journey beyond has been fascinating. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, it's nice, nice to meet you. And we'll have to go for a beer sometime. <laughs> <laughs>